pleasure to introduce James Brody to you today. He was hired at CU at College of Music in 1986 as the uh, full -time, first full-time oboe professor. And during the time here, he has uh, performed with the Takash Quartet. Some of you have uh, attended and, and are uh, often ones enjoying that. Uh, for a 10-year period, he was also with the Boulder Bach Festival as their principal oboist. Um, and he said, after noticing that there were some students that really had some physical and mental problems and concerns, he began what is now formulated and became the Musician's Wellness Program. And James was just now mentioning that Dan Schur was so instrumental in supporting this whole concept, which now has taken on a life of its own. He is a certified Alexander Technique teacher, and as such, has done a number of presentations throughout the United States, and most recently, uh, major conferences in Oslo, in London, and Tallinn. Well, when he's not doing all of that and traveling about and guiding his music students in their pursuits, he enjoys <coughs> thriving private practice at home, where he works with people from every walk of life. He is surprised that he is now a passionate and dedicated gardener. We didn't get to the detail if it's fruits, vegetables, or what. But at this point, I give you James Brody, and he'll give you a good lesson on this whole thing. Thank you, though. Good afternoon. Is there a chance that could be, Tyler, could it be dimmed a little bit? Yeah. Uh, Sorry, I, I have macular degeneration, and uh, it's, it, it, I, have, I also have a not so great cataract surgery all that not all that long ago. So, I'm just a pile of mess. So you see here that is a designated program of excellence in the College of Music since 2003. And yes, Dan Sher was uh, no pun intended instrumental in helping us get this off the ground. Uh, so, next slide, please. Thank you. This is what we do. We want to provide support for our students in a way that they don't get in their lessons or in the classroom. And education in a variety of things that we're going to talk about shortly. Oh, you say like that, good. I was just talking with Marty about the fact that oftentimes people will come by the Musicians Wellness uh, space in the College of Music. And as I described to them what I do, Musicians get injured? Yes, we do. It can happen. I have a slide to show, share with you about that that's actually a little frightening. And so if they are injured, if we can prevent it, that's great. If we can't, then we help with their recovery. And obviously, we want to set our students up for success rather than failure. That just makes perfect sense. Could I have the next slide, Tyler? My mentor, Barbara Conabal, used to address musicians and ask them to fill in the blank. Musicians for a living. How would you fill in that blank with a word or a phrase? What do musicians do for a living? Perform, play. Create. I didn't hear that. Create. Create. Study. Study. Entertain. I'm waiting for waiting tables. <laughs> that usually, that, if, if it's a group of musicians, that's usually one of the first things that gets said. We wait tables for a living. Now, what's true about everything that was just said is that one thing is common. Every musician needs to move to make music. When I said that to a group of singers one time, this young man said, I don't move when I sing. And I said, I would like to see that. So he walked out. appreciate that very much, but ah, this one, thank you. So when he, he showed me that he didn't move when he sang, he took a big deep breath and I said, too late, you have already moved, as we're going to find out breathing is dynamic movement. Let's see if I get this right. Oh. 
I share this slide with my students, not to frighten them, but to let them know what's out there, what's possible. Those numbers are staggering. What other job or situation would, would there be a 84% chance that you're going to become injured? Well, I do know one. Football would be uh, probably 100%, and baseball pitchers, 100% of baseball pitchers injure their arms during the course of their career. And you can see some of the reasons why these things happen. And again, as we look down the list, many of those things are preventable with good education, and that's my job. I've taken that on as trying to put music making on a really sound, somatic basis. And not just physical injuries, but the numbers on mental health for students in college right now are through the roof. It's really quite remarkable. And there are all kinds of reasons for that. Um, COVID was one, social media. I don't know if you've done any reading in that regard, but there are a couple of prominent authors who have basically blamed social media for a lot of different things. We have a terrific support system that I build up over the years. I lead wellness classes. As you see, it says, you know, basically about movement and general well-being. We are so fortunate that somebody in the upper level administration at CU woke up about six years ago and said, hmm, I think we should maybe pay more attention to the mental health of our students. And we had already been doing that in our, with the wellness program in the College of Music. I had enlisted one of my colleagues to serve as our sort of de facto go-to person at the Counseling and Psychiatric Services. When he retired, Matt Tomatz came on board, and he's a perfect fit for us because he has a music background, two music degrees. He worked at Aspen for 10 years, and then became a psychotherapist. And so he is our embedded psychotherapist at the College of Music. He spends most of his time working with music students, which is absolutely terrific. Right across the street from the College of Music is the Wardenburg Student Health Center. There are two physicians on our team, and we always direct our students to see them first, regardless of what the issue might be. Uh, Annie Sorotniak is a terrific physical therapist who happens to be an amateur musician, so she understands both the musician's body and the musician's mind. And there's lots more that goes on across the street, the massage, chiropractic, nutrition. It's a, it's a great system for our students. At speech and hearing, students can go and get their hearing tested, which is a great idea for a musician, and also attain, obtain slightly below market hearing protection. Uh, you may or may not realize the, the kind of volume that can occur in a band rehearsal or an orchestra rehearsal. It can be pretty darn loud, and I do remember when we were attempting to get the upper level administration to buy into the idea that we really needed a, a much more dynamic rehearsal space because the one that we had was on the small side. So somebody was really bright. They brought the marching band in and just set them loose for about 20 seconds. And that was enough to get the, the attention of, yes, yes, we'll fund it. Yes, just tell them to shut up. The, the students, uh, the Musicians Wellness Club, it's a, a terrific group of folks, and they, they drive a, a whole different story than I, than I provide. And there we have a lot of uh, folks in the community as well who are very helpful to us in, the, in our programs. I start off talking to this, about this stuff with uh, folks by showing pictures of kids. This little dude someplace in the Far East He's doing it just right, what he's doing, which is walking. Left foot forward, right foot starting to propel. Left arm forward with right side oppositional. You can see somebody walking like this. Check to see if they have a gun. <laughs> but likely what happened is they didn't, they didn't, uh, they walked too soon. They didn't crawl enough, and that can be trained in later. But he looks terrific. He just happens to be looking down a little bit. And at this age, the cognition level is not all that high. So if he's thinking anything, it's probably, look at those toes, those toes are so big, they're big, the big toes. That's about it. But he looks fabulous, incredibly well balanced. So a friend of mine sent me a picture of her kid by the pool. Beautifully balanced and upright. Now at this age, 
head slightly outsized to the body, the deep postural muscles are not all in place yet, not all trained up, and, and, and so sometimes kids look like they're hammered because they're just sort of bobbling around a little bit, but beautiful uprightness. Another picture was sent to me by a colleague of mine of her son and her father. The little Timmy there has the perfect zombie piano technique, which <laughs> if the keyboard sits your armpit level, that's what you gotta do. But otherwise, he looks terrific. Grandpa, on the other hand, what's up with that? What word or words would you use to describe what grandpa's up to? Slouch, slump, hunch, collapse. Some people would say that he's just relaxing. I'm now going to relax. So I encourage everybody to think, well, oh, maybe when I do that, I'm, I'm really collapsing. I'm not in balance. I barely have to touch this chair to keep it in balance. The further off balance it is, so the further off balance it is, the more I have to work to hold it up, either way. But when I find balance, I don't have to do much. Grandpa's working really hard. Little Timmy is beautifully balanced. So my students often will ask me, so when do people, when do kids start to slump? And I say, well, if you look at this picture and you see this young woman right here, upright, really nicely balanced, and her 70-year-old friend next to her, who is totally collapsed, about here. And it's typically when, when there's an external stimulus that takes our attention away from ourselves. And I'll explain that in just a few moments. But I realize, oh no, on the way over here, there was an amputation. He lost his leg. Oh no. Well, this guy's about 40 years old, and this plastic has deteriorated. Uh, Ted Mulcahy, a really terrific piano technician, has put him back together again more times than I can count, and now I just have to find the bottom part of his leg. We can do that. But I wanted to show you what Grandpa is doing. So if we have this upright person here, here's what Grandpa's doing. It's that much of a distortion, which is huge. And the consequences of that, as you might imagine, can be everything from restricted breathing to really distressing our organs. Organs like to have a little bit of space in there. So what I teach uh, primarily are two concepts, the Alexander Technique and body mapping. And the Alexander Technique, I can't, I can't really quite see that, unfortunately. The basic principles of the Alexander Technique have to do with primary control uprightness. It's the uprightness system that's in us. Everybody's got it. The kids that you just saw, they demonstrate it beautifully, uh, and adults, not so much. And the interference comes from downward pull, which is tightening your neck and dragging your head back and down and going into downward pull, which affects your entire system. And in order to, con you know, to counter that, we learn constructive conscious control, a thought process whereby we think our way out of this issue instead of moving our way out of this issue. Many students will come to me and say, oh yeah, uh, I'm told I, I'm supposed to imagine a string coming out of the top of my head. And I say, okay, two things. Uh, is there a string coming out of the top of your head? And if there is, where's the other end? Where is it attached? And if you are thinking of a string coming out of the top of your head, there's nothing pulling on you. You're shoving yourself up. 
So we learn how to do that internally instead of having that be an external concept that's myth. And in terms of body mapping, this is basically a way for us to realize the extent to, to which we can interfere with ourselves through a poor map. For example, let's see, I want to go to Golden, so let's go north for the entire circumference of the world. And we'll, we'll eventually get there, but we're not going to get there right away. It's how we perceive ourselves. And most of us perceive ourselves somewhat inaccurately in some fashion, including me. And we'll take a look at a couple things shortly. I can say that the Alexander Technique is, thank you, is something that's been a thread that's woven through my entire life. I had my first experience with it in 1973 when I was in undergraduate school. And it helped me to recover from a really horrible car accident. I had never been injured as a musician before. I was, uh, in other ways, I had been injured. And it dawned on me uh, as I was talking with students who were having trouble that this would be something that I could help them with in this fashion. And that was the, really the first little bit of the musician's wellness program that we started. So the Alexander Technique is a mind-body awareness method, and so I love cartoons, and I love Roz Chast, and that's one of my favorite ones. There's the problem. Okay, now you're going to get a quick lesson in body mapping and the Alexander Technique. How many main joints do we have in an arm? Big joints. Let's leave off the 19 finger joints. Six. I'm seeing, I'm seeing a couple numbers being flashed up. <laughs> there it is. Most of my students, when quizzed, tell me they had no idea that that was an arm joint. Everybody knows about their wrist and their elbow, and the glenohumeral joint. Joints are named for the two bones that are proximate to each other. So it's the humerus and the glenoid fossa of the scapula. But that one is one that most people do not, are not aware of, that being an arm joint. Which arm is this, by the way? Yeah, if it's your left arm, that would mean that your clavicle is behind your scapula, which is a problem I can't help anybody with. So this has got to be the right arm, because the scapula is in front of the clavicle. And we have three possibilities for rotation in our arm. And one of them occurs at that very joint that we were I was just discussing with you. So if you take your thumb, your left thumb, and put it on your right sternoclavicular joint. I happen to have a very sticky outy one. I was injured, uh, I won't say how, <laughs> and it, it, when it healed up, it just healed up as sticky outy. So I got my, and then I have two fingers on my clavicle like so, and then I'm gonna make this movement. And you should feel that rotation at that joint. Now a string player who doesn't understand that, when they try to get to the end of their bow, they're gonna get a little bit stuck. Also, if they don't understand that their scapula is what forms the joint here, they're gonna freeze their scapula to their body and the scapula is highly mobile. Or I should say, it can be highly mobile. Whoops, too far. Can be highly mobile. But many, many folks hold them in place. So we do exercises and movements where we draw, draw them together, move them apart, lift one, drop the other. We typically will do this in pairs so that there's feedback so that people can sense that kind of motion. And you see the trombone player down here. This happened to just the other day. The trombone player came to me and said, I'm really having a hard time getting to seventh position because he didn't realize that his scapula and his clavicle could move, so when he realized that, boof, seventh position, he could get there when he had his map corrected. 
Because if we have a faulty map, the map wins, not the actuality. And we operate ourselves as if that inaccuracy was the truth. Here's another good one. Oh, my teacher says I should rotate at my wrist. And I say, okay, let's try that on. So everybody, if you do this, so what you're doing is you're stabilizing your radius and ulna, and then try to rotate at your wrist. You can do all kinds of fun stuff, but the rotation occurs at your elbow. So supination, the bones are parallel, pronation, the bones cross, and that occurs at your elbow, not at your wrist. So when that happens, when a student comes to me and says, this is what I'm being asked to do, typically my response is, okay, let's, we need to translate what you're being asked. If you're being asked to rotate at your wrist and that's not humanly possible, well, how do we need to translate that into reality so that you can do what your teacher wants you to do? When I teach my breathing segments, I ask students to look at this diagram and say, anything there surprise you? Is there anything here that you didn't know or that really surprises you? What about you? Anything surprise you about this picture? <laughs> A student once asked me, is there any empty space in there? Is there just like room for let or something like that? No, it's, it, this is a crowded area down here. Clavicle, if you rest your finger right here, just behind your clavicle on the top, you're really close to your lung. I mean, it's, there's just some tissue there that's between your finger and your lung. Most people do not have their lungs mapped up that high. If you find your xiphoid process, that bone at the end of the sternum, and come across like so, the base of your rib structure, that's how far down your lungs extend. Many, many folks say, well, you know, my teacher tells me to get the air low. Okay. Now, if you could get air from down here, would you really want it? <laughs> Probably not. And what comes out of here is not air. It's something else. So this is... Uh, this massive waste disposal system down there. And anything, the only thing that's above the diaphragm, which I'm tracing right now, is heart and lungs. We want these things to be separate from this, for sure. And I'm also very fond of uh, being as accurate as I possibly can be. So when somebody says that they sleep on their stomach, which is right there, I say, do you get a pole? And it must be very uncomfortable to sleep on your stomach. So prone or on my abdomen, abdominal area. So there are so many amazing myths about breathing in the music world. One of them has to do, Marty, I'm almost out of time, right? Close? Close. One of them has to do with the diaphragm, which is a huge muscle in our bodies. Highly domed at rest, attaches all the way around to the ribs, originates here on the spine. And when the diaphragm acts, on inhalation, it gives a little tug on the lungs, partial va vacuum is created, air comes in. Uh, I have students telling me that they, their teacher is asking them to play with diaphragm vibrato or to play from their diaphragm. So, okay, this is a muscle that does 75% of the muscular work on inhalation only. Muscles work in one direction. So uh, it's not possible, since we don't have any direct control over the diaphragm, to do, uh, it's, it's just not possible to do. So then, again, we have to translate and see if we can figure out what the intention is and then get to the reality of it, because the facts are friendly. Truth always is much better. And the shot from below, the central tendon there, because muscle's got to pull against something. Big muscle, lots, very big muscle. And I'm really fond of this diagram to share with my students the idea that there, 
the other 25% of the, whoops, that's the wrong way. The other 25% of the work is done by your intercostal muscles, both the ones that lift the ribs and then the ones that can aid in more active breathing. Because if you're playing the tuba, passive recoil is not gonna make a whole lot of sound. You have to encourage that air out to be, to be much more quickly delivered. And so that's why we use some musculature in the abdom abdominal area. But one of the issues that I was just working with a horn player on this morning is not over tightening this musculature. Because I, I asked her to do what I asked my class to do. I said, okay, now everybody, we're gonna get abs of steel, okay? You make your abs really tight. Really just, it's as hot as a rock. Now take a breath. You can't. Because when you tighten up the rectus especially, you hold on to the rib structure. Ribs got to move when you breathe. And the diaphragm is splinted. It stops moving. So we have to find this really delicate balance between activating musculature that's going to help us play the tuba and not freezing us in place. I won't spend a whole lot of time here, but most people have no idea how big their tongue is in their mouth. It can be quite, quite the thing. But it could also be made much smaller. And there's a wonderful video if you feel so compelled sometime later today. Sarah Willis, she's the, a horn player in the Berlin Philharmonic, and she uh, was put inside an MRI machine and played the horn. And it's fascinating to watch her, her tongue in action. It's really cool. Text neck is a thing. It's a, it's a, now it's a diagnosis, a term that's given in the medical community. So if you're up, I've never seen anybody use a cell phone like this, by the way. But in balance, your head weighs, what it weighs? You know, roughly about 10, 12 pounds. And the further you go off balance, in effect, the heavier your head is. Every morning when I walk in the building, there's somebody sitting in the hallway looking like that. And I just want to say, oh, stop, please. Don't do that to yourself. It's not good. So let's spend seven hours doing that. Or if you're a heavy user, let's spend 13 hours doing that. That's a lot. That's a lot. This freaked me out. I think I was in the Dallas-Fort Worth airport. <laughs> not my favorite. And this kid, I don't know, not, not yet too, for sure, on the phone, their flight gets called. Mom puts the phone in her back pocket. The kid goes nuts, crazy, trying to crawl over her to get to the phone in her back pocket. Don't do that. So my admonitions to my students, free your neck. A free neck allows your head to balance on top of your spine. You'll have better balance. Let's remove interferences. Put down the phone's a good one. If we boost our awareness, then we have choice. If we don't have an awareness of what we're doing, we don't really have choice. Rest is not so valued in our community, especially in the music community. More, louder, faster, higher. It's like, let's take a pause, take a break, reconsider. And I can encourage my students to be patient and perseverant. That's me. Uh, my uh, email address is very simple. In fact, it's just brody at colorado.edu. And our wellness, this is a view from the wellness space that I took the other day. Uh, it's on the third floor at the west end of the new wing of the IMA Music Building. And uh, when I have a really big class and a lot of the students are back by this window, I might as well not be there. <laughs> because they're not looking at me. They're not paying any attention to me. They're watching cars go up Flagstaff. I mean, it's like, it really is quite remarkable. The, the, uh, when the builders and the architects and everybody came through at the building dedication, they said it took them about five minutes to decide what would be in this space after they had met with me about wellness. So it was very, very cool. I have great ideas for improving the, the, the wellness program. I was just talking with Marty about a couple of them that uh, Oh, it would be so great, but if anybody has a bag of money sitting around that they don't need, just let me know, because it would be really cool to have. It's a, more, more of everything that we do, a full-time 
mental health care practitioner, a full-time physical therapist in our building would be so cool to have because we desperately need those sorts of things. But I'm retiring at the end of the year, so it's, it's no longer up to me. The next person can take a shot at this. Thanks for your attention. Um, I grabbed my phone. I was wondering if there's any possibility you go back to that slide where you saw the, uh, or showed the, uh, the, um, there, right there, so that I could get a picture I wasn't fast enough. Thank you. It's pretty frightening, I mean, to, to consider that. And again, this is not, everything that I've said to you today is not my opinion necessarily. Most of it's just based on fact. And the thing that, makes me so disappointed after 50 years of doing this is that we shouldn't have to talk about it. It should be instilled right from the beginning. These ideas should be right, and then I would be out of a job years ago, which would be great, but we don't always give good advice. I admired, uh, thank you very much for, for a, a very insightful presentation here. I, I admired the picture uh, toward the beginning of the little kid at the piano. You don't have to show it again. We all, we all saw it, uh, and the kid's posture was wonderful. I, and it was seen to me that, uh, that if you built piano legs a little longer, I, adults would be able to uh, maintain the same posture. Has that been tried? Is that a good idea, or am I crazy? Uh, the world is built around the concept of one size fits all. And in the wellness space, we have chairs of three different heights. The standard height for chairs, this is not a, I don't think this is quite standard, but it's 17.5 uh, inches. Uh, then I have 16.5 and 18.5 inch chairs in the wellness space. I also have little lifters for some of the students who are even taller. And when I put a tall person or a person of shorter stature in an appropriately heighted chair. I remember the look on this young woman's face. She sat in the chair and said, what? There's, this is real? Yes, yes it is. And speaking of instruments, we are uh, currently the beneficiary of a reduced size piano keyboard. Uh, the standard keyboards that have been in, in place for a long time were built for large German men with, you know, with large hand spans. But pianos weren't always, didn't always have keys that wide. And we have a keyboard that slides in. It takes a little bit more than just to slide in and out, as Ted Mulcahy would tell you. But uh, a young woman in my class, we got her in there for an hour. And when I saw her uh, the next day, I said, how did it go? And she said, well, I spent the first 10 minutes crying because she could play the piano. She can't play this thing. No, Rachmaninoff had huge hands. He could do anything. And you try to play his music if you have a hand span even as big as mine, can't be done. It's not possible. And then people get injured. So rebuilding things to suit different sizes makes perfect sense. Yeah, my question uh, concerns, uh, we have a good friend who has a son who's a jazz drummer. Uh, he had ADHD when he was a kid, drove his parents crazy. He found the drums, which temporarily solved that problem, but then drove them crazy a second time. Um, he was so into the drums that he had uh, got repetitive motion injury, and he had to completely relearn how to play. And I wonder, are you teaching drummers how to avoid that? Absolutely. I'm teaching anybody how to avoid things that are going to interfere with what they want to do. So a, a lot of drummers will, mm, I'm just thinking of Alex, he, we just last worked on, uh, on a marimba. And so he was standing like so at the marimba, looked a little bit like a dentist. I've worked with dentists too. You know, if somebody's got power tools inside your mouth, you want them to be well balanced. You know, <laughs> oh, I'm so sorry, I bumped the cheek or something like that. So, uh, basically, what's there's a couple possibilities. One is likely overuse, just going and going and going and going and not taking a break. That and maybe that had, had been driven by the ADHD too. That just 
I gotta keep doing this, I gotta keep doing this. That's quite possible. And as I said, you know, rest is not very, not very highly valued in our community. It needs to be much more highly valued. We do something called constructive rest, which is lying down and there's a whole bunch of procedures around that too. And people say, well, I don't wanna rest right now, I'm on a roll. It's like, take a break. You, what you're going to find out is that all that stuff that you're working so hard on needs to be consolidated in your brain. And if you're just go, 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 and you don't take a rest and don't get adequate sleep and good nutrition, then that stuff's not going to stick. It won't be consolidated in your brain. So it's also possible that his technique was faulty. Lots of uh, jazz drummers don't get a whole lot of good instruction at the beginning. It's a lot of self-teaching, and some self-teaching is great. Some... Not so good. Thank you for be, making us aware of how being a musician is an athletic performance. So I really do appreciate that. And as an athlete, uh, you know, I learned a string theory, you know, and all that kind of stuff. <laughs> Keep the string on my head. But uh, the question I have is, um, I actually use, I try to have good posture. And I use this, uh, this little device called Upright Go. And it just kind of buzzes and reminds me if I'm not in the, you know, if I don't have good posture. And I just wonder if you use any of those kind of techniques uh, in your business. I'm not crazy about those. Um, there are certain crutches that I kind of like. Uh, a well-placed Pilates ball, not in your lumbar spine, but at the juncture of your lumbar and thoracic spine when you're okay. sitting in a chair. Uh, the saxophone studio at CU is everybody's doing that now. I, I've got them all with a little half-inflated Pilates ball right there because that gives you a little bit of a boost upwards. It's just a reminder. The, the, one of the issues with those devices is that what do you do when you get the buzz? And what most people do is they stiffen up as opposed to, well, no, look, I'm going to search for balance here. And that's, what I, that's basically what I train people to do is to find balance all on their own, no outside crutches which to me is, I think, a better way to go long term. If you found it to be helpful, then knock yourself out. I mean, who am I to say that if something works, great, do it. Professor Brody, thank you for being here today. A job well done. Not only was it really informative, but pretty humorous as well. So you I kept tried to tone that down this time. Oh, I see. Okay, well, we really appreciate it. You know, um, one of our traditions here is that a Rotarian always gets the last word after a speaker gives a presentation, so I'm it. Um, and I, I want to encourage everybody. I watch the videos that are on the College of Music's um, website. And in particular, one of them, which is only like six or seven minutes, but was your conversation with Edward Dusenberry, the first violinist at Takish. And I must say that his testament to your wellness program's um, value to his students, but also to him, who, and he's you know, a consummate performer, um, served to underscore your longstanding efforts to improve the physical functioning and overall wellness of the College of Music's community. Um, and we want to thank you for that, and it makes all of us better as well. <laughs> I'll work on this, put my elbows in my pockets. Anyway, um, uh, you know that the eradication of polio has been a long-term project of the Rotary Clubs all over the world. And while we're pretty close to reaching a goal of er eradication, we still have a ways to go. And in your honor, our club will be donating 100 doses of polio vaccine to the Polio Plus program to help reach that goal. So thank you for being here today. Thank you so much. My pleasure. My pleasure. Let me get my crap. I just stepped on it. Oh, you did.